Well, as I said, we're in the, the book of Esther, and I'm going to just recap it real quickly, as quick as I can, and get us up to speed. So if you've been gone or, or haven't been here at all, you know the story of uh, the book of Esther. Now, Esther ties in with a bunch of things that we've been doing over this last year. It ties in with our Daniel Bible study. I talked this morning. I don't know. I'll try it again. Bible study. Okay. As we went through vacation Bible study, we worked through the book of Daniel and looked at some stuff there. We, we preached through some other sermons uh, earlier this summer that tied in. Uh, the book of Ezra and Haggai and some of these other books of the Bible are about the same time period. And, and, and the backstory of this is... Um, the Israelites, if you know your Old Testament story, kind of have an up and down relationship with God. And they struggle with idolatry. They struggle to continue to regularly follow God. Now, of course, we could be critical and look back and go, oh, you terrible, evil sinners. But the truth of the matter is, we are a lot like the Israelites. We too have our own ebbs and flows and ups and downs in our own lives with sin and following God and not following God. But what had happened was the Israelites had a season where they were not following God closely. God warned them, said, I'm going to judge you if you don't turn or want to turn around. They didn't. And so what happened is this bad guy, King Nebuchadnezzar, came in. Uh, they were Babylonians, and they took all the Israelites captive and dragged them off about 700 miles from Israel and enslaved them. Well, as happens in history, one king replaces another, and eventually uh, these guys get knocked off, and a new re regime comes in. This new king comes in and looks around at all the Jews who are slaves, and he didn't really like that system and said, why are you guys here? You're free to go. Go home. Go back to Israel. So a lot of the Jews did that, because as an Israelite, you were supposed to live in Israel. That's an inherent part of it. But some of the Jews who were living there looked around and said, you know, we kind of like it here. Things are going pretty well for me here. I don't think I'm going to go back to Israel. And so they stayed where they weren't supposed to stay. Uh, and that brings us into this group of people that would include Mordecai and Esther, who were in the story of Esther. They had stayed behind. They're living in this town called Susa. And the Persians were now ruling. And uh, this king by the name of Darius had greatly expanded the Persian kingdom. He hands everything off to his son, King Ahasuerus, right? Most of us don't know that name, but we know him by the name of King Xerxes. And so King Xerxes, his son, takes over. This is the, the boy prince, and he'd lived a jaded life. He'd never had anybody say no. He'd had everything he ever wanted. When he becomes king, he's the richest man on the planet. He's the most powerful man on the planet. He has the largest army on the planet. He can do whatever he wants, whenever he wants, with whatever he wants, largely. That's his life. And, and not only does he have that, but we know from history... On top of all that, he does have an ego to go with it. He has an ego the size of his bank account. Uh, he, he had this throne. He loved to sit on his throne. He loved to have people paraded across in front of him, that they would have to bow down before him and see him seated up on his throne, high and mighty and important like. And so he, he, he really liked people making much of himself. And he had this ego. And, and the story is that he threw this party for, for half a year for all of his generals and political leaders. And... At, towards the end of it, he calls for his wife, the queen, her name's Vashti, to come in and, and to kind of dance for him and some of the guys, and she tells him no. Now this is a man who's not accustomed to be told no, and not only that, the other men in his life who counsel him say, if she gets to tell you no, what's our wives going to do to us? You've got to do something about this. So he gives the queen the boot. He gets rid of her and he replaces her opens up kind of a bachelorette, like on the TV style of recruiting, trying to find the most beautiful lady of the land, and brings in a bunch of young virgins, and they all get to have a tryout with the king to see who's going to be the next queen. Through that process, Esther catches his eye, and catches his heart, and she becomes queen. Now the thing that needs to be told along in the story is along the way, uh, Mordecai is Esther's uncle, but he's also her adoptive father. And they're Jews. But you see, nobody in the story knows that they are Jews. They, they haven't probably been living out their faith in such a way that anybody could tell that they are the people of God. And they haven't bothered to tell anybody that they're, they're the people of God. And so Mordecai's got just a basic old run-of-the-mill job working in the government. Esther's the queen. Well, Mordecai's working one day at the city gates, and he hears word that a couple of guys are plotting to assassinate the king. Well, what do I do with this? Well, I guess I know the queen. She's my daughter slash niece. 
Uh, I better put some word into her and have her tell the king something's up. So he sends a note off to Esther. Esther gets it. She tells the king. King does some investigating. Sure enough, story is true. Two guys are plotting to kill the king. So what's the king do? Of course, he has them killed. That's what kings do. Now you would think at this point in the story, then Mordecai should get some reward, right? I mean, he just saved the king's life. That's when you get the, 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 the big prize, right? You get the golden chariot or something, but nothing. And in fact, not only nothing, but to kind of add insult to injury, he doesn't get anything at all. But this guy who turns out to be kind of the enemy gets a promotion instead of Mordecai. There's this man by the name of Haman, and Haman is an Agagite. And if you don't know who the Agagites are, let me tell you once again, they were the oldest enemy of the Israelites. They were the first people to go to war against the Israelites. And so for generation after generation after generation, the Israelites have not liked the Agagites and vice versa. They hate each other. This is the old Hatfield McCoys before the Hatfield McCoys. They don't like each other. And so the early hearers, the Jews, as they would hear this story, when they hear Haman the Agagite, they go, Oh, that guy. Ick. We don't like the Agagites. Why would he get the promotion instead of Mordecai? Mordecai did the work. But yet Haman, he gets this promotion. And, and effectively what the king does, King Xerxes, is makes Hagen like his right-hand man and gives him power and authority. And Haman, he, he wants to be like the king. So he models his life a lot like the king. And he too has this big ego. So every day, Haman, he goes down to the city gates. He's got his own little throne. Not as big as the king's throne, but a, a good-sized throne. He goes down to the gates on this throne. He sits on this throne and he expects everybody, just like they do for the king, to bow down before him. No, everybody pretty much does this. They come by, they bow down before him, they go about and do their business. Except for this one dude. This one guy, every day, doesn't bow. Now, if you ever walked with a rock in your shoe, you don't make it very far, right? It starts to irritate, it starts to bug you, it starts to bother you. Well, that's kind of who Mordecai was to Haman. Mordecai, for whatever reason, at this point in the story, decides, uh-uh, I'm not bowing to this guy. And so he doesn't. And every day everybody else bows, but every day there's Mordecai. Finally, Haman's like, who is this guy? Why isn't he bowing? Oh, Mordecai's a Jew. All right, I know. You know, usually when you try to get somebody back, you, you just, you know, you get that dude. But not Haman. Haman says, you know, I, I really don't like this guy. And I, I dislike him so much, not only am I going to kill him, I'm going to kill all of his people too. We're going to wipe out the Jews. And so Haman hatches a plan, goes to the king, gets the king's permission and authority. There's a decree that's sent out to all the corners of the land that states, on this day, we're going to kill the Jews. And the way that Haman convinces the king is he goes into the king and he says, you know, there's some people living in your country. They don't always necessarily follow your rules. They don't really think you're the top of the heap. They have a God above you, king. It's the Jews. And if you let me take care of this little problem, we're talking a couple million people, if you let me take care of these little problems, once we wipe them out, I'll sell all their stuff and I'm going to give into the government coffers half of all the proceeds. So huge, huge tax bonus, right? Kings like those things. So he signs off on it. Sure, sounds good. All right, free money. woo -hoo. Well, the king doesn't know that his wife Esther is a Jew. She hasn't bothered to tell him. Now at this point in the story, they've been married for five years and that topic has never come up. And it gets us to the point in the story, the Bible tells us that for 30 days, in fact, the king and the queen hadn't even seen one another. She's living in her wing, he's living in his wing. Now there were some rules that stated, unless you had a prearranged appointment with the king, you couldn't see him. If you came and knocked on his door and tried to come in and see him, they chopped off your head. Now there was an exception to that rule. If he extended his scepter to you to touch it, then you were permitted to come in without an appointment and speak to him. But otherwise, you're putting your life on the line if you go and knock and ask if you can speak to the king. Mordecai gets word to Esther of all these things that are going down, all these problems that, that these you know, Jews are going to be killed, that this decree has gone out. 
course, Esther's like, well, all right, I, I need to do something about this. She sends word back to Mordecai, gather the people of God in the city of Susa, fast, fast for three days, and probably pray. It doesn't say pray, but probably pray. Fast, though, for three days for me, and on the third day, I will go before the king. So Mordecai does as she asks, and on the third day, Esther goes and gets in, a, in front of the king, and he, of course, does extend the scepter, so her head stays on her shoulders. And he says, my darling queen, what can I do for you? Anything you want. Up to half of my, half of my nation. Now, of course, he's not saying that because he wants her to take half. He's just trying to show himself off as being generous, right? What do you want, queen? What can I do for you, darling? Why did you come before me today? Well, she's kind of shrewd. And she says, you know, I mean, most people at this point would go, hey, this dude over here sitting next to you, Haman, he's going to kill all my people and you should do something about it. But it seems like she knows he's not ready to hear that. So she says, darling, honey, uh, how about I cook you dinner? And why don't you invite Haman? Haman, Haman, why don't you come too? Just you, me, the three. That's it. That's all we'll have. We'll have dinner. Okay. Okay. That sounds good. I like to eat. See what you got. So... Esther cooks some dinner. The end of dinner. All right, darling. What'd you want? She thinks about it for a little minute, but it would appear in Scripture she's not quite ready yet to make this request. And so she says, how about tomorrow? You and Haman come back again. I'll cook you a feast again. We'll have a a good eat. And then I'll tell you. All right, well, that's pretty good food. I think we can do that again. Sure, all right. Sure, let's do that. We'll come back tomorrow. Well, as this is going on, Haman, of course, has got this ego and this pride. And he's going back and he's telling everybody, hey, anybody here uh, who's having dinner with the king and queen tonight? Did you, did you have, was it in the paper? Anybody, was it on the radio? Did anybody get that? Did you, did you hear it? Is it a party? Is it a bunch of people? No, it's me. Me and the king and queen are having... Not, you're not having dinner with the king, are you? Did you ever have dinner with the king? You, you haven't had dinner? Oh, it was so good. The queen's a great cook. It was delicious. You've never had dinner at the king and queen's? Right? He's got an ego. He's making much of himself. He calls in all the neighbors and all of his friends to tell them about it. Right? Look at me. I'm a big man. I'm important. That's Haman. And then... He happens to see this guy, Mordecai. He's walking out after having dinner with the king and queen. He sees Mordecai and he's like, there's that guy again. He's like a rock in my shoe. He's driving me crazy. I've got to do something about him. So he asks his friends, eh, what should I do about this guy? He's driving me nuts. So his friends, their counsel is, why don't you build a gallows, you know, where you hang people 75 feet high and kill him there. That sounds like a great idea. I think we'll do that, right? So Haman has constructed this this giant gallows. Now, as I said back in the story, Esther said, I'm not ready to tell you after that first dinner. Come back tomorrow. And so we're at this point of tension where the king doesn't know she's a Jew. He doesn't know what she's going to ask of him. Haman doesn't know she's a Jew, but he's just built a 75-foot tall gallows to kill her father and uncle. So there's some tension in this story. And she says, just come back tomorrow, we'll have another feast. And at that point, the Bible tells us Haman was feeling pretty important about himself. In verses 5 through 9, it says after he went out, he went out high and happy in spirits, right? And as I said, that's when he sees Mordecai. And, And this guy is stealing, stealing Haman's joy. And, and the Bible tells us that Haman was filled with rage. But he knew that soon Mordecai and his people would be eradicated because of this edict that had gone out on his behalf. And so as I said, he calls all of his friends in together. He brags, I'm the only one. I'm the only person Esther invited to accompany the king at the banquet. Not only, not only, not only was I the only one there tonight, but I get to go back tomorrow, right? That's, that's this guy. And she has invited me along with the king tomorrow. But all this gives me no satisfaction, he said, because I saw that Jew, Mordecai, sitting at the king's gates. 
That was verses 5, 12 through 13 we saw last week. And so the plot thickens. He comes up with this plan with his friends to assassinate, to take out, to wipe out Mordecai particularly. There's a plan in place that's going to eradicate the Jews on top of it. Now, of course, I imagine Haman was up late at night plotting with his friends. But this is where the plot really thickens. There's another person who happened to not be able to sleep that night. You see, the king seems like he might have overindulged a little bit, had a little bit too much to eat. Hell, uh, indigestion. Anybody ever have that, right? Maybe you eat too late at night, or if you're like me, if you eat something red, pasta, pizza, something with tomatoes in it, chili, late at night, oh, fire burning in my belly, right? Ooh, that's burn. That's kind of what happened with the king. Sounds like they had a good time together. He, he, he ate and ate and ate. Well, he wakes up in the middle of the night, he's like, oh, oh indigestion. He's like stumbling through the royal palace trying to find some Tums or something. And, and his gut's burning, and they hadn't invented Tums yet, so he didn't find any. But uh, I, I would call it a holy case of heartburn myself, or, 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 or God-induced insomnia or something. But he's, he's restless, he's uncomfortable, the story tells us. And so he's like, man, what can I do? He's counting sheep. Doesn't work. Probably had some warm goat's milk. That didn't work. I can't get back to sleep. What would put me to sleep? I know what would put me to sleep. One of you servants come in here and and read me some of the logs of the business of the government, right? Yeah, that's going to put you to sleep quick, right? That put all of us to sleep, especially the king. And so so he calls in a servant to to come and, and read from the official records to him. But as, he, as he's probably about ready to doze off, they get to the part in the records where it talked about Mordecai and what this servant had done to save his life. And he kind of startles almost awake. He's like, read that to me again. Mordecai. Huh. When you're reading that, does it say, did we do anything for that guy? I mean, he saved my life. Did, did we honor him? Did, did, did we, you know, anything? Flowers? Something? Nothing? He saved my life. I, I didn't do anything for this guy. So, so King Xerxes is a little embarrassed, right? That this guy had literally saved his life and nothing. He, he'd forgotten. Nothing special was ever done for him. So it's at that very moment, coincidentally... That horrible Haman comes walking in, right? He arrives at the court that day, so he could be first in line because he wants to get there first. He wants to be the first one to talk to the king because he's come up with this plan to hang Mordecai and he wants to make sure the king's on board with that. And so he gets there early so he could be first on the list for the king and uh, gets in and, and Haman is summoned by the king. He's in the king's presence and Haman's thrilled because he thinks, all right, I'm going to get to wipe out my arch enemy. I'm going to get rid of this guy who's like a rock on my shoe. I'm going to be able to kill Mordecai today. It's going to be a good day and then I'll have dinner with the queen and the king tonight. What better day could I possibly have? And the king, he comes in, he sees the king. The king, hold on, Mordecai, hold on, Haman. I, I got a question for you real quick before, before you start talking. Uh, uh, he says, Haman, Haman, what should be done for the man that the king delights to honor? Says that right there in scripture. Now Haman, of course, you know, he's this guy with an ego and pride. Haman's thinking, he's talking about me, right? He's got to be talking about me. He wants to honor me. Chest out, yeah, me. Right? This guy's like a a proud peacock. Look at me. Well, in in Esther 6, 8, and 9, if you're following along, it says, Haman's response says, well, if you want to honor this guy, Have them bring a royal robe that the king has worn and a horse that the king has ridden and have have this guy, this guy, be led around, paraded around in the streets by one of the king's most noble princes. Right? I mean, Haman's pouring it on thick. Here's how you can honor me. Because he, he wants people to see him, right? Make much of me. I'm a big guy. I'm important. Well, the king's like, oh, yeah, I like that idea, right? That's a good idea. Haman, I need you to do that. Get the robe, get the horse, 
and give it to Mordecai, the Jew. Now you can imagine, Haman's like, <laughs> you hit the brakes here. What did I just walk into, man? I mean, he was going to hang this guy. But of course, he's smart enough not to open his mouth at that point. I can't imagine he had a good attitude about it, but he did obey. But his only comfort was, he knew that Mordecai's days were numbered because the edict had gone out to kill all of the Jews. His days were numbered. So kind of like a dog with his tail between his legs, Haman goes out and does what the king has told him to do. And all that night, he shows up again at the palace for Queen Esther's banquet. Once again, the, the king, after they've had dinner, asks Esther, 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 darling, honey bun. I don't know what he called her, but I, I imagine honey bun probably, right? <laughs> yes, sweetie pie. Honey bun, what could I do for you? You brought me here two nights in a row. What do you want? Now at this point in the story, Esther has finally become courageous. She's ready to, to really live out her faith, to take a bold step. Faith involves risk. And scripture tells us, she says to the king, If I have found favor with you, O king, if it pleases your majesty, grant me, grant me my life. This is my petition. Spare my people. This is my request. She's now, for the first time, identifying herself with the people of God. She says, For I and my people have been sold for destruction and slaughter and annihilation. See, the king, to this point, had no idea he had signed a death warrant for his own queen. And so, he asks her, Who is this man who, who, who dared to do such an evil thing? Esther calmly replies, remember who's at dinner with him? The adversary is the enemy, this vile Haman. You can imagine Haman probably fell out of his chair at this point, right? Ooh, it's the big one, right? Red Sanford. And at this point, you can imagine the king flies into a rage. Steps out. I got to clear my head. I, I got to step out. Because this, this is his right hand man and his wife. Steps out, clears his thoughts. Get some fresh air for a minute. Well, while this is going on, Haman runs over to the queen. He's begging her. Oh, but you know, you imagine, kind of puts his arm around her. Oh, you got to do me a favor here. I mean, I, I, I was, I was kind of, I wasn't serious about all that, killing everybody. I didn't. I love the Jews. Let's be pals, right? You can imagine the stuff he's trying to say to get her on his side. And he's got his arm around her or on her. And he's like, can you, something, help me out here. Well, this is the time where the king walks in. Sees another man with his arm around his wife. And there was laws against that sort of thing. You don't touch a queen. He's thinking, this guy's not only trying to kill my queen, but I step out for a minute and I put the moves on my wife. Right? In verses, uh, chapter 7, verse 8, he says, Will he even molest the queen while she's still in the house with me? So Haman is, then as the story, we're going to speed forward, and is let out of the palace and experiences some poetic justice of sorts because he ends up being hung on the 75-foot tall gallows that he had intended for Mordecai. And not only that, the king knows his edict has already gone out, and... He may not be able to get everyone to stop. So instead of being able to quickly get that to a stop, what he does is he sends out armor and weapons to all of the Jews so that they could defend themselves if somebody did try to enact this evil law that Ham Haman had sent out. And we see in the story, because of Esther's faithful stand, her people were now saved. Now, as I said, there's some other scenes in the story that take place but I want to hit the pause button here so that we can focus and highlight some of the lessons or, or principles that we can learn from this story that will help each and every one of us take a stand as we look at the main characters of this book and as we wrap up this sermon series. There are some important, important principles along the way that we've been hearing. And the first one comes from Queen Vashti. 
Queen Vashti took a moral stand. Though she doesn't have a big part in the story, Queen Vashti had the courage to take a moral stand. She knew that her morals would have been compromised had she walked into a room full of her husband and a bunch of his drunken men. And she would not cross that line because she valued her dignity. How about you? Do you need to take a a moral stand in one of your relationships? Is somebody trying to get you to compromise your morals? Don't do it. Take a stand. Hold your ground. If you've already crossed that line, ask God for forgiveness and make a fresh commitment to have moral courage. It's never too late. Maybe... Like many of us, you've just been justifying what you're doing, but deep inside you know what you've been doing is wrong. And if that's the case, it's time to quit fooling yourself and live God's way. Let me add quickly that that, that taking a moral stand is not always easy. It's not. In fact, it can often be controversial and unpopular. And and sometimes when we take moral stands, uh, there are unpleasant consequences. Though Queen Vashti did the right thing, she lost her position of royalty and was banished from the kingdom. It requires some courage to take a moral stand. Is it worth it? You bet it is. The second principle we see from Mordecai. Mordecai takes a spiritual stand. Because Mordecai had finally surrendered his life to God, He was unwilling to worship anything or anyone else. And that's not always an easy stand to make either. I mean, for some, even here today, it might have taken some courage for you just to get up this morning and to come to church. Family that are going, why do you you go there? Why do you waste your time there? We could could be watching TV, or we could be sleeping, or we could be down tailgating, or we could be somewhere else other than wasting your time at that church, right? Sometimes it takes guts for people to come to church. It can be easy. Bedside Baptist, right? Pillow Top Presbyterian. It's easy to stay in bed. Sometimes it's easy just to stay home. It's easy just to wander through life indifferently. If you don't have strong convictions about your faith, you'll never have to speak up about what you believe in. But folks, being a Christian takes some courage. See, it takes some courage. If you're going to be a Christian, it takes some courage to admit that you do fall short morally, right? That you are a sinner in need of a Savior. That you screwed it up and you can't fix it. It takes some courage to admit that. To admit that you need God. And it takes some courage to ask Jesus to forgive you. And it takes some courage to receive Him into your life and to follow His leadership in your life. And it takes courage to tell others about your decision. Romans 10, 9-10 through says, If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, then you will be saved. For it is... With the heart you believe and are justified, and it is with the mouth that you confessed and are saved. Friends, are you you man and woman enough to take a spiritual stand in your life? Do you have the courage to believe in your heart that Jesus died for your sins, that He rose again? Do you have enough courage to stand up and be counted as a follower of Jesus Christ? Do the people around you even know that you're a Christian? when you leave these four walls? Have you been hiding your holy heritage? Let's be like Mordecai and speak up for what we believe in. The third principle we can see out of the story comes from the character of Esther. Esther takes a positional stand in the story. With the help of a family member, Esther began to understand that God had put her into this place at this time to make a difference. She demonstrated extreme courage and faith by doing something that could have ended her life. Many of you know who Andrew Jackson was, great American. And he was the one who said, 
One man with courage makes a majority. I think one of the great lessons that we can learn from this story is that God has placed each and every one of us in a position where we can have a unique influence on others for good. Don't ever think that you are insignificant. God has put you where you are at this time, at this place in your life, to make a difference. He has put you in your family for a very specific reason. He has placed you in your neighborhood to be salt and to be light. He has maybe enrolled you in your school to have influence on others. Maybe given you that job to make a difference in someone's life. God has placed you exactly where you are for a reason. And you cannot be replaced nor repeated. Who we are and where we are carries with it a heavy responsibility. Each and every one of us has a God-given niche that only we can fill. Yes, Mordecai warns Esther, if you don't step forward, God will bring somebody else in. That is true. God is still sovereign. But I do believe that God has put us in this time, in this place, for a reason. That God created you on purpose, for a purpose. Sometimes we want to get ourselves out of our situation, right? I don't want to be in that job. I don't want to go to that school. I don't really like my neighbors. And sometimes, yeah, we should get out of situations. That is true. Discerning wisdom from God. But I often wonder if we don't miss out on some opportunities simply because we're just too busy grumbling about our work, too busy complaining about our neighbors that we don't like, too busy looking down on our classmates or our coworkers. Listen, God, God never allows anything to come into our lives by accident. Behind every circumstance, we face a greater purpose than we can see in that moment. Maybe you need to just quick... Take a deep breath and say a quick prayer. That you need to speak up and speak out. Look at where where God has positioned you. And then look for ways to use that position to save eternal lives. Just like Esther did. She saved lives. God has put you where you are. Not simply for you to enjoy the benefits of your position. Or just to tolerate your job. Or just... To read a magazine like you're in the waiting lobby of life, waiting for your appointment with a doctor that's always a half hour late. That's not what God has called us to do. Look around yourself. See the people that God has placed in your life for such a time as this. He's put you where you are to help save lives. Take some holy risks, just like Esther did, and watch what God can do. We need more Esthers in the world today. Esthers who are willing to rescue a nation and a world that has been condemned to die. We need some people willing to live with a little bit of reckless abandon, to live the life that God has called us to. We need more people, if you know Hudson Taylor, the the great missionary to China. Hudson Taylor went there and his prayer was, Give me China or I die. And there are millions and millions of Chinese Christians today because of Hudson Taylor. An amazing legacy. We need some sold out Christ followers who will say, Give me Aiken County or I die. Let me make a difference, Lord. The fourth character that we can draw a principle from, and the final one I'll mention, is from God. As we look at God in this story, his name is never actually mentioned, but he's all over. His fingerprints are there. Recognize God's sovereignty. Though God's name is never mentioned, he is evident everywhere from the beginning to the end of this story. Someone once said that that a coincidence is simply a time where God has chosen to act anonymously. He may be invisible, but he's invincible. His will will be done. See, he brought Esther to Persia. He gave her beauty so that she could win this Miss Persian beauty contest, right? So that she could become queen. And he placed Mordecai in the right spot at the right time so that he could discover the plot to assassinate the king. And then he used Esther's cooking to give her husband heartburn. Holy heartburn, right? To make sure Haman was in the right place at the right time so that he could honor Mordecai. 
Hunt for God every day in your life, looking for the evidence of His leading. Expect to see Him working in the ordinary of your life, and you will be overwhelmed by how many times you will find Him at work. Hear me. There are no coincidences with God. Life is filled with appointments and not accidents. Kind of like Bob Ross. Remember the painter? Happy little rocks and he doesn't make mistakes. They're just happy little accidents. That's how he painted. That's how we should live as Christians. God is at work in the intricate weavings of our our fragile human decisions. And even though God's name is absent from the book, God is touching every scene in the story of Esther. And God has chosen to to work out His plan today, just like He did back in that day, through average, ordinary, everyday men and women like you and me, people like Vashti, Mordecai, Esther, people who are willing to maximize their ministry potential by taking a stand morally, spiritually, and positionally. Several years before the Soviet Union broke apart, Nikita Khrushchev, who was the premier of the USSR, he was speaking before the Supreme Soviet, which is the most important of all the political leaders in that communist country at the time. And in in that, he was speaking and he was being very critical of Joseph Stalin. And somebody wrote a note and sent it forward. Somebody out of the audience, one of the political leaders, and that note was brought forward to him. And all it said on that note was, what were you doing when Stalin committed all of those atrocities? Because you see, he was in the government at that time. What were you doing when Stalin was doing this? Khrushchev got this note. He shouted, who sent this note? No one said a word. I'll give you one more minute to stand up. Who sent this note? Second by second ticked by, still no one moved. After the minute expired, he stood there. He said, all right, I'll tell you what I was doing. I was doing exactly what the writer of this note was doing. I was doing nothing. I was afraid to be counted. See, Khrushchev was afraid to stand up against it. Are you afraid to be counted? Or are you willing to stand up morally, spiritually, and personally as you recognize that God has sovereignly placed you exactly where He wants you for such a time as this? It's not by accident that God has placed you where you are now. So we're going to close in prayer in just a second. But before we do that, I'm going to ask you, I'm going to ask you to stand in just a moment. If you're willing to maximize your ministry potential, please stand right now. If you're willing to take a moral stand, please stand. If you're willing to take a stand spiritually for Jesus Christ, please stand. If you will take a stand to use your position where God has placed you to make much of Jesus so that the world would know. If you're willing to make a commitment of that sort, would you please stand? Please stand if you'll commit to use what God has given you for His glory to make a kingdom impact. Let's pray.